Montana State University. Montana's only top tier Carnegie ranked research one institution that <laughs> hired <laughs> Sometimes we take our cultural institutions like museums and universities and public libraries for granted. And I can assure you that's a mistake. Understand that this museum where we are tonight, like this university, we are adjacent to. These institutions aren't simply here. They were built. They took a lot of hands, a lot of time, and dedication and no small amount of money. The same can be said of this, the Wallace Stegner Lecture and the Stegner Chair. And it's thanks to the efforts of many people, Susan Heineman, who's here with her son, John, Cliff and Joan Montagna, the Britons, Corky and Vanessa, who can't be here, and so many others. I want to thank all of you for your contributions to making this evening possible. Some of you with very good memories will remember that it was about 20 years ago, at the beginning of the efforts to raise money for the Stegner Endowment here at this university, that Wallace Stegner himself stood on this stage with this auditorium packed and an overflow crowd in the planetarium watching a television feed. The Stegner Lecture is one of the jewels of the crown in this university. It honors one of America's great writers, whose books I think many of you are familiar with. But there's one you probably have heard of, but it's an addition you may not be familiar with. This is, I'm going to be careful of it, because otherwise Kim Scott <coughs> in Special Collections have my hide. This is an addition pretty rare edition of a book called The Big Rock Candy Mountain. It's an edition you don't see very often because it's condensed for wartime reading. And the label on the book reads Armed Services Edition. So this was for American soldiers who became familiar with Wallace Staker in some ways before many other people. The overseas edition for the armed services distributed by Special Services Division ASF for the Army and by the Bureau of Naval Personnel for the Navy, U.S. government property not for sale, published by additions for the Armed Services Inc., a nonprofit organization established by the Council on books in wartime. Another book, actually my favorite statement, one you may not know about, it's called One Nation, put together by Wallace Stegner and the editors of Look Magazine. It's a book written at the end of the Second World War. It is on the cut cutting edge of this nation's fight to end discrimination and racial apartheid in this country. Many of you may not know that Wallace Stegner was on that edge, absolutely on that edge. And I was reminded today of something I didn't know about this community. This will test your historical knowledge, your historical memory, but some of you will know the name Marian Anderson. Marian Anderson, great singer, African-American singer. She came to Bozeman, Montana in the mid-1950s. I didn't know that. I'm embarrassed I didn't know that. She was invited here to be part of the community concert series. She sang in town. She was denied a place to stay at a hotel in downtown Bozeman, Montana. Okay. Wallace Stegner's book, One Nation, at the cutting edge of the fight for social justice in this country. The Stegner Lecture comes to you this evening through MSU's Department of History, Philosophy and Religious Studies. It's hosting this evening's event, and I especially want to thank two individuals, Cassandra Balint and Hanny Basir. Cassandra, you are here. Where is Hanny? Thank you guys so much. 
and also Professor David Cherry here in the front row. Cherry. <laughs> Just on a personal note, I want all of you to know that every day I have the pleasure of working with some of the most wonderful students and talented teachers and scholars that can be found anywhere in this country. And no, this is not just Rydell puffing up the history department. Case in point, a couple of days ago, the Guggenheim Foundation announced its fellowship winners. And one of those Guggenheim Fellowship recipients is our very own Professor Brett Walker. Brett, you need to say yeah. yeah. And so to reiterate something I think all of you know, this is a special place. And it's made even more special this evening with this year's Stegner Lecturer. Rick Bass, a writer who enlivens our imaginations with every turn of the page. Rick is the author of many prize-winning short stories and books, including the Book of Yak, Wild to the Heart, The Deer Pasture, and Why I Came West. The last was a finalist for a National Book Critics Award for Autobiography. Rick has lived to the north of us, where we were in Montana since the 1980s. And he's dedicated much of his energy to finding common ground between environmentalists, loggers, snowmobilers, in the pursuit of gaining public support for creating more wilderness designation for public lands in Montana. Stegner may have said this, he would have been more eloquent, but in two words, fight on. <laughs> so in the spirit of, spirit of Wallace Stegner, in the memory of Wallace Stegner's presence on this stage, Please join me in welcoming Rick Bass. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you for the, the lovely introduction and, and the uh, I just have to say, this is how I feel, a free history lesson. <laughs> I, I, I just so totally, I'm gonna to look at the auditing, whatever you're teaching. <laughs> Commute, oh, wow. That was, uh, I was taking notes, thank you. <laughs> very, very, very cool. Thank you guys for coming in um, to hear this evening. It's, uh, you know, sometimes you get, you get to, you get old enough and nothing makes you nervous. And so then when you get nervous again, it's a good feeling, it's rare. <laughs> I'm just savoring it, but if I black out, that's what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I kept saying the S word so many times. Stagner, Stagner, Stagner. <laughs> I thought this was just Bozeman. No, this is, that's Stagner. I thought it was just Montana. No, it, it, uh, you know, we're talking about heroes. Um, yeah, I just must. I'd do better to not think about it. Let's change the subject. <laughs> oh, Cassandra and, 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 uh, and Chair Perry and, uh, and Rob, thank, thank you all for, uh, for having me here. They've been working on it a long time, lots of little tiny moving parts that I uh, just had a bunch of emails uh, and stuff and a lot of work. And thanks for all of that. It's, it's not easy and it's appreciated and it's a gift to community. I've shot so many shotguns. If I was a good shot, I would have shot half as many times as I have, but I'm a really bad shot. So I've shot a lot of times at departing birds that do not fall from the blue sky. And I'm deaf as a result. And, and run a lot of chainsaws. Uh, I don't know if it's Connie or it, 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 Connie? What? Connie. Huh. Connie. That's what it sounded like she said, but I never heard that name before. And so I, I apologize for, for uh, mishearing. But thank you also for, for, for everything. Um, you know that thing dogs do? in the summer when the grass is tall and, and they lie on their back and they just kind of do that butt scooch rip, wriggle. With their that, that's how it feels to be here with, with so many of my, my friends here. Just kind of <laughs> in a time of war, it's nice to be loved. And, and, uh, it's, it's so great. Uh, Dave and Darnell, thank you guys for making it in. And, and, and Maria and Noah, thank you all for coming in. And uh, uh, especially Doug, Doug and Andrea, thank you guys for, for getting in the truck and, and hauling over here. And, uh, 
you know, Doug has had, you know, on his knees put, different knees put in and, and, and uh, all kinds of shrapnel cut out and different vertebrae cut out and different vertebrae put in and different hips taken out and different hips put in. And, <laughs> and one of them takes has got a new hip going. You know? I don't want to get graphic. I like being graphic. I, 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 that's not what I to say when I get graphic. I'm happy to be graphic. Um, he's got a hole in his leg at this very moment that is bleeding. And, and he's got a duct tape wrapped around. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's uh, really honored to have, have your blood in the, in the theater. That's who they are. Likewise, it's so great to be in, 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 your, uh, in, in your home. Uh, uh, I'd rather think about y'all than, than uh, Mr. Stegner, whom so many people call Wally, and I just can't, I just can't say the word. It's just, uh, <laughs> Teresa, thank, thank you all for, for coming in too. Uh, it's a, a long haul from the Yak. Uh, I'll talk about the Yak in questions and answers, but I, I want to read a couple of essays. One about the Yak in the West, and then a, one about uh, Montana and, and the here and now. Um, oh, th thanks to the, uh, the bookstore also for, for having so many books and an embarrassing number of books and, and uh, manning, manning the tables. And uh, thanks to our friend Terry, who's not, not here, but all my other friends in the world are here. And if she were here, I would be wriggling even more in the tall grass. But that's it's not the only person who's not here. I'm really, really happy about all of it. I live in a place that amazes me. This is the condition of love. The eye and the soul loves that which it beholds that is familiar and is amazed by that which is not and may never be familiar. This is the condition conducive to what Wallace Stegner, in describing the emotions stirred in us by the Western landscapes, called the birth of awe. I live in such a place, a place that has really never been lived in fully before, or if so, maybe only once or twice. For the small handful of us living here in the Yak Valley of extreme northwestern Montana, right up on the Idaho and Canadian borders, there is a responsibility in this newness, not quite that of a creator, but in some ways almost, for what is being created with each day and each year is a story. And as Bill Kittredge tells us, stories matter. And first stories, I would suggest, matter most of all in the way that the first scouring of ice, the ragged claws digging furrows in the exposed Cambrian bedrock, determine so strongly the course of so many of the other natural processes that are to come. Beginning writing students will recall that there are really only two stories in the world. A man or a woman goes on a journey or a stranger rides into town. Mine was doubly rich. I went on a journey and I rode into town. <laughs> I moved from the lush and verdant east, Mississippi, to the west to become a writer to live in the mountains. Or rather, I was already becoming a writer, had just started, but was beginning to repeat the same colors in my stories, greens and yellows. I had been west before. I'd gone to college in Utah, had skied and snowshoed in the steep blue mountains, had backpacked in the red deserts. The greens and yellows of the east had stimulated me, but they did so, I realized instinctively, and if there is one thing I believe in, it is instinct and our 180,000 year capital investment in those tactics. They did so with a quick sugary flash of fine fuels, dry yellow grasses in August, rather than the deeper, slower, more powerful burning of the blues and whites. Those colors burned too, but did so in the manner in which frostbite is a kind of burning, something deeper and something that does not go away easily. I was hungry for the cold implacability, the sleep of glaciers. I was young and needed more dream time. I was not quite ready to awaken. I didn't know why, but I knew it. I knew it deeply enough to be drawn back north and west, abandoning my life in the south and east with the same unconsidered relentlessness, perhaps, with which a salmon turns inland and pushes steadily up into the mountains carrying with it the nutrients from the sea. We are all part of something larger. We know this, yet we spend our days forgetting it. We are all part of something larger. 
There is no in-between. It is either this way or there is only nothing. The place I found, moving toward it without knowing it was out there, was the newest place on earth, the Yak Valley, just about as far north as you can go in this country. The bitter edge, the sweet edge. All artists, I believe, belong in one way or another at the perimeter. They would become lost if too long in the center. They would vanish, would be absorbed, would no longer be able to exert their polarizing influence. It occurs to me that wilderness, that tiny but so powerfully charged 3% of America's landmass that is designated as wilderness, helps hold together the spirit and fabric and in many ways deep core depth of this country's soul. In the West, there is wilderness in our soul, whether we realize it or not. There are those who assert the presence of another who loves us, whether we accept that love or not. That that is what it is at the center, the center of something, and that we ourselves scramble around its edges. The best evidence we might have then of such a presence is its absence, the paths of our orbits circling around it, staying just in contact at its outer edges. How can I prove to you that we need wilderness in the West, that as we develop and grow, we need more of it than ever? I can't. I am neither mathematician nor chemist. There is no proof yet, but I would stake my life on it, have staked my life on it. The Yak, the newest place on earth, had likewise remained sleeping, even as the rest of the world was being born or reborn during the West's most recent incarnation. As the last of the Ice Age pulled back, the retreating ice shredded the spires and cirques of the Rocky Mountains, but the yak remained sleeping. For whatever strange reason of gravity or precession or cant and ellipsis, the ice pulled back from the rest of the West but remained several thousand feet thick over the yak. A cold spot, a low and sunken spot, with all that weight pressing down on the earth there, forming like a potter with clay the mounded animal shapes of hills and smooth muscular humps and ridges rather than the jagged saw teeth of the other mountain ranges. I didn't know any of this when I first crossed over the summit and looked down into the soft blue bowl of the yak. I knew only that I felt a clarity, an awakening, a youthfulness and a vigor, a rawness of energy and beauty, a deep peace and resonance far within even as I felt my outer bands and shells and the outer laminae of possibility become stimulated and a buzz. I wonder now if it was not a sensation that the land itself might have experienced when the last of that ice receded several thousand years ago. No one has ever lived here. The Kootenai were the first people a fish culture that followed the Columbia inland and who sometimes came up into the yak in the summer to hunt woodland caribou and mountain goats, but who, or so I am told, never lived year-round in the snowy yak. And why would they, when they could drop 4,000 feet down into the more tropical climate of the Kootenai River, the lowest point in the state? It amazes me to realize how very few other places, if any, there are on the earth that have been so uninhabited. The first year-round Yak residents were the miners who began inching their way up the Yak River at the beginning of the 20th century. Scarcely three generations have resided here year-round. Other than the Arctic and Antarctic, you would have to go to the sand dunes of the Namib to find a place with a hollower human history. But what I've seen in the Yak, what I think the Yak has that is so valuable for the rest of the West, is the incredible example of how these first stories matter and how to some degree in the West we are all still living first stories. In the Yak, no one knew anything. We were all entering the newness together. It was and is all so newly formed that even words still mattered, mattered hugely, as did certainly ideas and memes and stories. Actions mattered too, but people had to hear about them. 
Some seeds had already drifted in and tried to attach, but I think that ultimately the soil was too thin to sustain them. <coughs> Brief and errant ideas like the belief that you could start clear cutting at one end of the yak and by the time you reached the end, the trees, the wild forest would have grown back in. Such was the logger's belief in the low elevation rainforest productivity. But that story hasn't lasted. <coughs> it lasted less than a hundred years. It took some energy to deconstruct that old story, to fill in those shallow grooves, but I think we are finally filling it in. Some things, special things, once gone, are not so easily gotten back. Now we are back to the baseline, back to the bare, smooth stone that awaits its true scratch, the furrow or furrows that will help shape and influence the direction of what comes next. Not for one and two or even three generations, but for a far greater length of time. Dozens of generations, thousands of years. It is good to dream big. Sometimes I believe it is in the condition of dreaming that we are most fully human. Then, and when we are embracing, celebrating, observing, or even creating beauty and art. I will admit, I will confess, it feels harder these days to dream big. I think this means that it is more important, more necessary. It is often in rarity that the condition of value resides. What story should we tell then in any new garden? What story should we nurture? Maybe it's too soon to have the answers, but I believe as an article of faith that the arts and wilderness are paramount that they are the soul of the West, beneath our thin new soil. For a little while, we did the cowboy and Indian thing and the commodity thing, the rugged, rough-hewn, macho extraction of ore, cattle, timber, furs, coal, oil, blah, blah, blah. And then those things began to run out just about the time our macho ran out, to which I say good riddance. Also withering on the short vine was the myth of rugged Western independence. My own county, Lincoln in Northwest Montana, which, let me assure you, contains some rugged individuals, is quite possibly the most heavily subsidized county in the nation. The average income is around $25,000 per citizen, and last I heard, the per capita government expenditure in Lincoln County, EPA, USFS, DOI, FHA, FHA, VA, BPA, etc., was about the same amount. I'm told there's only six trillion dollars of currency in the world, that everything is leveraged, speculated, subsidized, propped up by smoke and mirrors and faith. Every nation, every community chooses its values, just as every corporation, gifted now with the powers of free speech, even anonymous speech, despite not owning the lyrics, externalizes as many costs as possible to a willing and too passive society. The coal companies, the oil and gas companies, the humanities, the ranchers, we are all living in the speculative bubble of one subsidy or another. Contemporary humankind is in no way a sustainable venture. Instead, we are a newcomer, an experiment in the garden. A beloved one, perhaps, but not, it would seem yet, sustainable. Let me just say this. It takes money to live in a hard place, and the harder the place, the more money. And likewise, sometimes beauty is not cheap. Wilderness, however, the most deficit-neutral policy on the books, the gold standard for an unsubsidized existence, and provider of basic ecosystem services we can no longer even afford, and yet cannot afford to not have, is the finest investment in sustainability a region can make. And it grieves me that the so-called conservatives do not marvel at and revere this simple truth, but instead seek with the force of dogma to eradicate, eliminate, liquidate any and all potential wilderness. It's been over 30 years since Montana has passed a wilderness bill. The yak itself is at year 48 without wilderness and still counting. The vine of that old story has completely withered the pipe dream fairy tale children's bedtime story of the Westerner as a rugged individual needing nobody. We might have had nobody out here. The West can be a lonely, isolate place, exhilaratingly so for some. 
But to say we need or needed nobody is just false. Maybe this then is the spirit and identity of the West. The tension, the at times vast space between the needing and the not getting. And the spaciousness that we allow to surround our loneliness. It is not necessarily that the ache or solitude of each human soul, the human condition, is so different in the West, but that here, this human condition is not compressed. It has space in which to resonate, to echo off different walls, to roll across deserts, to slide over snowy slopes, unobstructed and undeflected by others of one's kind, who, paradoxically, are not always even the antidote. Here is a story, a little story from the dark, far woods of the Yak, where we yet have barely any soil whatsoever. A young man, a man of art, Scott Daly, who has protected the Yak, who has dreamed wild visions for it, assembled grand puppet spectacles, parades, and week-long music festivals on behalf of Yak Wilderness, and just across the state line in Idaho, a community radio station broadcasting culture and music over a land where few have ever resided, is exfoliating. He came here from the east, and now he is being carved and cut, reduced to whatever one last thing burns within him. He saw the yak, fell in love with it, and the yak, the wild yak, continues to glow and prosper because of his choices, his efforts. He is building the soil in a garden where the soil is so thin that it barely covers the crackling heart, the crackling essence of the bare stone. He keeps shedding pieces of himself in the most dramatic fashion. This is the way gardens are made. Soil is created slowly, and something or someone new drifts into that <coughs> garden. And it's the way history is made, too. We're all shedding something every day, exfoliating like crazy with every hour spent or not spent. Each of us is building the soil and the soul of the West, whether we aim to or not. Scott has a bad bone cancer, has been fighting it for years. Sometimes it spreads to his lungs. He's had the tumors removed, then a leg and a hip. He's had the spots burned off his lungs. It stayed out of his brain. He's still Scott. He's still writing grants for the Yak Valley Forest Council. He keeps limping along. His daughters are 10 and seven. His wife, a massage therapist, can't work anymore. The stress of their situation the one they inhabit now and the one to come, has given her chronic psoriasis. The skin is literally peeling in sheets and tatters from the hands she once used to make a living. Scott is one of the lucky ones in our culture because he works for a nonprofit, the Yak Valley Forest Council, that provides insurance. It's not enough, of course, but it slows the rate of financial disintegration. The Yak can be a rough place to advocate for wilderness. Not as rough as in the old days, and that's due largely to Scott, who, in the passion of his youth, used to go down to the bars and defend wilderness, not with Abbey-esque philo philosophizing or Stegnerian eloquence, but the old-fashioned way, brawling and fighting, punching back when shoved. <laughs> the bully culture of intimidators had never seen an environmentalist quite like him. It was a time back then of death threats, pipe bombs, and car burnings, and he battled them to a draw. There were just a handful of us back then, trying to pass through the eye of a needle and into the future, into a time and territory where we could speak of one's heart's desire, our soul's need, without persecution. Someday we will have wilderness designated in the act. Someday you will even be able to say the word wilderness in town without getting into a fight. And those fortunate residents of the future may not even be able to imagine how difficult it once all was. Stories like Scott's must not be forgotten. They are the true and good foundation from which we are all just now setting out again. This is an astonishing thing to say. The West is not necessarily defined by aridity. There are portions in which aridity is a huge factor, and surely more to come. 
but for every salt plan playa, every caliche cap rock that has influenced an artist or a community in the West, an intrepreneur, there is also a creek or a waterfall. Even here at the new edge of drought, the new normal, the West may not so much be defined by aridity as instead by that spaciousness. In many places, of course, that aridity creates spaciousness, that aridity e equals spaciousness. But that has not entirely been my experience. It is true also that there are places in the West that are not spacious. But to my thinking, the space between things, due in part but not wholly to aridity, is the larger governing principle beneath which the West exists. And in that outer physical spaciousness, loneliness can take wild root, as can fear, or paradoxically, generosity. This is how narrative and story proceeds, passing from darkness to light, from absence to presence, from conflict to resolution. As if in a weather pattern, the presence of a high-pressure ridge also creates an associated low-pressure trough. I think when we first came to the West, we made the wrong choice. We had a 50-50 chance, and we made the wrong decision. But it is precisely that wrong choice that has created the opportunity now, the still unexplored territory of the correct choice in a territory that still awaits us. There is a lot of talk these days, specifically since October 2008, when we officially entered the Great Recession, about the new financial normal. There is a strong belief among many that the new business model of the nation will call for somewhere between 9 and 10 percent of permanent unemployment, that something big has changed, and that the country has not so much tilted as finally fallen, and that we cannot quite find a way yet to get back up. It is said that things are better, and it is said that there is even an economic recovery underway. But I still see the distrust in people's eyes, the wariness, and that is a good thing. For to try to staunch the inner wounds of spaciousness with money would be to retell the precise story that led to the first delamination, or whatever number this one is. I see people, especially in the West, moving more slowly and thoughtfully, not getting seduced by this recovery. And that's a good thing. I believe that we were starting to unravel long before October of 2008, and in ways that had nothing to do with a speculative bubble in the housing markets or complex financial derivatives. I do not deny those bubbles, but I think there was already something else wrong, too. I think that there was, and still is, a fundamental underlying dyssynchrony in the path we have chosen. And it is more than a little as if we have long been sleeping beneath a thick ice cap, slumbering and dreaming dreams in which there was no responsibility, only to now awaken as a quickly warming world melts away the last of that protective shield. Now, unlike before, we can see our responsibility. What stories do we tell them to fill in the wounds? Not our stories of old genocide, surely. As the eastern half of the country was built on the false foundation, economically as well as morally, of slavery, so too does our own in the West particularly rest undeniably on genocide. If a nation or region is built upon a wrong, then should not the corrective story seek to address the opposite of that wrong? If a nation or a region has been built upon taking, should not the news stories be predicated then upon giving, in an attempt to fill in, as if with a sentiment such as lusts, those first grooves that led to such falseness? In the yak, I think the first false cycle has already flamed through, has burned itself out, consuming all the little fuels, the dry summer grasses that in their burning made a great spectacle, but which left no real legacy of nutritive or substantive worth. Only the thinnest scrim of ash, lighter than a feather, and likely to be whirled away in the first wind. Even in such a rough and tumble place as the Yak, the place where outlaws go to hide, the strangest proclivities are arising as if from some place deeper than even that thin soil. A potter here, a painter there, a poet, a story writer, and most commonly musicians, 
flutist, guitarist, singers, saxophonists, clarinetists, drummers, fiddlers, mandolin players, bassists. There is creativity at the edges of the wilderness, a creativity in the paths we circle at the outer edges of things, especially the unknown things. The best thing we can do for the West and ourselves is to keep alive and unharmed these fountainheads, these wellsprings, these gardens, whether we consciously enjoy or even care for our wild places or not. All Westerners, whether urban, rural, or suburban, somehow benefit from the wild gardens, the wild spaciousness that is still out here in places. You don't have to understand or know or even like a thing in order to benefit from it. Another of the Yaks gardeners is Robin King. Unlike Scott or myself, she really doesn't know the deeper wilderness. She's content just to live at its edge, is not drawn into its center, does not find alluring the long bushwhack, the mosquitoes or blizzards, the sweat and physical toll. Her passion is social justice and community <coughs> development. Her passion is making a place for peace in a valley where always before there has been war. She co-founded the Yak Valley Forest Council 14 years ago, not long after I published an angry book, The Book of Yak, that criticized the U.S. Forest Service resistance to protecting wilderness in the Yak. Robin called me up one day after talking to a friend, Dave Henderson, using a friend's phone. She and her husband, Jimmy, live, as do most of us, off the grid, no phone, and solar panels, batteries, and a backup generator for the laptop, and said, that's just not right, that there's no wilderness up here and that people are getting ostracized for supporting it. We should form a little group to give local voice to that cause. Great, I said, who will be in it? Well, you and me and Dave, she said. <laughs> Since that time, we've grown to about 100 supporters with roughly 1,000 national associates. It's still a pretty tiny organization with perennial budget challenges, though we stretch a dollar further than any nonprofit I know. Robin became our executive director, working in an office where rent is $150 a month, heat is from a wood stove, and with no running water, just an outhouse. She does have a computer. She does have a fax machine. Against all odds, we've succeeded, with the valiant support of Senator John Tester, in introducing a bill in the U.S. Congress that will finally designate wilderness in the Yak. Robin administers a local Workers in the Woods program, too, using unemployed loggers and other local residents to restore damaged watersheds and wildlife habitat in the hard-logged Upper Yak. We've also initiated a conservation education program in area schools and after-school hiking and camping clubs. We've come a long way in a relatively short time, even though in other ways, given the 24-7 nature of our work, working in the place we live and living in the place where we work, it feels like it's been much longer. Robin goes to a lot of meetings. There are only 19,000 people in all of Lincoln County, but it's the largest county in Montana, nearly 4,000 square miles. The Yak itself, a million acres, is 97% national forest. Robin drives to meetings in Eureka, Troy, Libby, Stryker, Fortine, Street, Trigo, Kalispell, Helena, Missoula, Rexford, Bonners Ferry, Sanborn, British Columbia, and the Yak, in addition to lobbying in D.C. She meets with loggers, mill owners, snowmobilers, ATVers, hunters, anglers, teachers, Forest Service personnel, county commissioners, senators, and representatives. I go with her when I can, but I do not make every meeting. Often the meetings are stressful and acrimonious. Several years ago, during the most intense meetings, yet another mill was closing. She would walk out of those gatherings and comment that she felt like the top of her head was going to explode. I thought she meant figuratively, but a couple of years later, the doctors found a meningioma growing in her brain, or rather, on the bony skull cap above her brain. They rushed her in for surgery, sawed her skull open, removed the growth, glued and stapled the skull back into place, and sent her back to work. I think in all, she missed maybe a couple of weeks. Like Scott, she's pretty irreplaceable to our organization. Her work is her life. It is not a job. It is a spiritual mission to protect wilderness in the yak. She will give until there is nothing left to give. 
In some way I cannot prove or even well articulate, wilderness is still the electric pulse, the generative current for the West stories, whether as unnamed backdrop or tightly focused center. The wilderness can be the wellspring for the false stories we labor to fill in, the unsustainable stories of limitless taking, and the stories of modest and measured sustainable giving. The West is not what we would call resilient. The fact that it has survived the takings of the past, the colonialization, despite a lack of resilience, is testament to the power that resides in this center of its essence. What can we give to the future? Creativity. We are no longer owned by the East. We need not be a colony any longer, exporting our dirty coal from Otter Creek to China so that it will come right back to us and to the world in the form of an increasingly heated world, skyborne lead and mercury and acid rain. We need not scallop Northwest Montana's Purcell Mountains in the Yak on the Kootenai National Forest to hollow out the world's largest asbestos mine, the dangers of which W.R. Gray's knew for decades, but who, until 1990 after passage of the Clean Air Act, operated within the limits of the law of the land even while killing hundreds and sickening thousands in a small town of only 2,900, with more deaths surely to come across the decades and perhaps even centuries as those tiny, disturbed carcinogenic fibers, too small to be seen, continue to swirl amidst the dust and smoke of the living. We need not give the tar sands of Alberta via the Keystone XL pipeline a permanent industrial corridor through the heart of Montana. We have wind and sun, and we have imagination. I have a friend who is working as a climate change scientist. He produces his own food, rides his bike to work, but he also tries to measure the pros and cons of blasting huge volumes of aerosols into the sky to help slow the rate of global warming, protecting the tender atmospheric outer arc, the farthest perimeters of the Earth with a kind of shading mechanism. He's discovered that one of the troubles with this proposal is that that will make the earth cooler, but even drier. There is always a cost. There is always a balance. There is an accountability, an accounting of all that we have taken. The earth is essentially a closed system. It can be no other way. And we might as well start now. The West is defined not just by heredity, but by space and by mystery. And my greatest hope for it lies in two things, the physical wilderness and the ineffable spirit that emanates from that wilderness. With those two things, we can still control our destiny, for we can still preserve the beating heart, the essence that differentiates us from all other places. With those two things, we can still live an extremely creative and unique existence. We do not exist isolated from those other places. Everything is connected, but we are still unique. The world desires to go on. Out of the thinnest soil can come a great and fantastic yield, the richest imagination. In such terrain, the first or easiest choice or path may not be the longest lived or most sustainable. We can no longer see the great inky sheet of the BP Gulf spill. Like a sea monster, it has gone back beneath the surface, has settled to the bottom of the ocean floor, has infiltrated the marsh grasses and the flights of birds. We cannot see the toxic pit of death, the tar sands mining in Alberta, where a pit, an abscess of Cretaceous death the size of Florida, is being dug up from beneath the boreal forest that previously absorbed North America's carbon dioxide even as the heated exhalations of a melting ice cap began releasing the storehouses of carbon that are greater than every barrel of oil and every ton of coal that has ever been burned. If technology is going to step up and help extend, if not sustain, this journey, it's time, technology and a carbon tax that prevents the corporations from continuing to externalize their massive cost, past, present, and future, onto taxpayers. In counterintuitive fashion, I think beauty is the call to plug the leaks in the ship of Earth while we try mightily to correct our errant tilt, to climb back up onto the ridge we once occupied when we first wandered into this garden, and to choose the other path. 
We cannot waste too much time in these burning days, dwelling over much on the wrong stories, the dead-end choices of unconsidered taking that were so alluring, so easy. The stories we need to search for and create now will likely of necessity exist at the other end of the spectrum. It seems counterintuitive, but is not the world's beauty the thing that has most sculpted us as a species, and the West beauty the thing that has so influenced us as Westerners? We may be one of the only species that makes art. Our eye is drawn to beauty. As all the other experimental outer shells of our evolving cells fall away, that is surely what remains at one of our deepest cores, the thing we must most and last defend if we are not to disappear. I fear that time is now. I fear that our outer loops and spools, the indulgent experiments, the extraneous outer laminae, are eroding, have been eroding, and we are, as perhaps we once were in the beginning, when we started out in a garden of great beauty and bounty, now in a state of diminution, where that is the thing our eyes are most drawn to, the thing that will lead us through the proper gate this time and down the proper path. Things peel away from us on the outside, even as certain other things build up inside us, like the much vaunted treasures of heaven. Any new story of the West, any next story that we wish to endure, where so many of the older, once briefly bright ones blossomed, must acknowledge that we are all smaller, whittled down, occupying a territory of diminished and diminishing physical resources, if not yet possessing a diminished spirit. The question of what is to be the future of the West is not a false dichotomy of more technology or less wilderness and mystery. It is a question of first filling in the physical holes we have made in the landscape, the pits and gaping wounds, and of filling the inner wounds as well. It is also a question of how much generosity we can find and how much respect. It is, ultimately, a question of manners. There are heroes out there, more than we might realize, men and women like Wallace Stegner and Doug Peacock and Terry Tempest Williams, laying down their lives, men and women burning, searing new stories onto the cold stone that the ice has only so recently left. There are men and women preparing a garden for the world to come, laying down their arms and drawing a line in the sand, saying there is much we no longer defend, but we can and will defend beauty, and will continue to celebrate it where we can, and to create it where we can, until whatever final darkness is coming eventually overtakes us, and we lie back down to sleep for a while. We have been here a long time, and yet we are only now awakening, and only now starting out in the West. Everything else up to this point has been as if but a dream. It is a bright and heated world, a terrifying world, with loss and danger all around us, where once and long ago, inside the dream, there seemed to be unlimited bounty and unlimited time. But it is still very much the West, and the one thing, the essence, the beauty, is still intact. There are still some hours left to each and all of us. We can still do with them what we choose. It is springtime yet again, and still it is almost as if the garden has not yet even really been planted, or is ready only now for its next planting. It is definitely time for different crops and different gardeners.
<laughs> the great thing about getting older is you get to live all these different lives. You get to die, rot, be born again. You get to make mistakes, try again. You get to try to live by reason, and if that doesn't work out, by instinct. You can try a mix of the two. In one of my previous lives, I was an earth diver, an oil and gas geologist, descending into worlds that were a beguiling mix of the deeply physical. Sandstone, shales, and limestone reefs a quarter of a billion years old, gritty and stinky with the sweet green-black rotting oil juice of old death. And yet it was a world of deep imagination, too, for it was your dream that led you there first. This was in the days before computers, so that you drafted the maps with your bare hands, drawing the contours that would determine your path into those unseen lands below. If the map you dreamed had integrity was correct in all the important ways, you would pass through those gates and down into the buried landscape you had seen or prophesied. You had not made that landscape, but you had definitely created the route. And once you got there, if you got there, the treasure would be waiting. That was a long time ago. I found so much of it. I was good at it. I had an eye for it, a heart for it, and as I traveled those hills and beaches in my imagination, I developed a mind for it. The searching built within me an architecture of electricity that combined reason and imagination. Sometimes you could get to the hole by one path, other times you took a different path. That was one of my old lives. There were others, one of which was fire-breathing local environmental activists working long hours to protect its wilderness, the last roadless lands in Northwest Montana's Yak Valley. My passion in that particular life was for the furthest and farthest places, lands where no, human, lands where no humans were to be found. I think it's fair to say that while I was not out to abuse the poor, they were not much on my mind. I was too busy abusing the rich during the timber wars that were ruining the community where I lived and ruining the incredible wilderness that is the essence, the signature of the West. Beauty still matters. I lived a lot of different lives and hoped that more remain, but germane to this story, I was once an earth diver. I exulted in leaving the company of mankind in a way more complete than any leave taking I have ever known. I thought those old days of oil and gas had died and fallen away. It seems strange to me that they have returned, that I'm feeling the desire and instinct to dive and dive deeply as I did back in the long ago. The completeness of the dive, the impassioned thrill of the roller coaster descent, was perhaps similar to the letting go of death. Except in those Paleozoic plunges, those pin-your-ears-back-and-go hurtlings down into the caverns of treasure, you always knew you'd be coming back, and there was always something to come back to. This time, I don't feel that way. This time, I worry that everything that is beautiful will not be there when I come back up, when any of us come back up. This time, then, we must all go down together. When Bill McKibben and the folks at 350.org asked if I'd come out and get arrested with him at the White House to protest and draw attention to the proposed Keystone XL pipeline, I jumped at the chance. It seemed to me as natural a response as dropping a postcard in the mail, which for these first 55 years of my life has pretty much been the extent of my efforts on behalf of the beautiful green world. I've done all the obligatory stuff that we do as environmentalists joined organizations, wrote books and magazine articles, attended half a lifetime's worth of meetings, gave talks and lectures, all the boring old necessary ground and grunt work that has led us to where we are, which, despite some fine days, is still a very bad spot. A spot so bad that we must remake everything within us, I think. Must toss out our old hopes and fantasies and instead reach into a place and what an old-fashioned word this is, of reckoning. In that place, where you look finally at not just the true state of things, but the what comes next, well, the science of it is a bitch. It hasn't at all been an overnight change. 
Bill, for instance, has been talking about what's happening for over 20 years, but it's here now. We each helped bring it. We all helped bring it, and now we each have the moral chance of trying our best to unmake it, to send it away. I, for one, am grateful to Bill for preparing a path, cultivating a heart of furious and abiding love, as if tending a garden. I'm grateful to him for keeping the gates open so that those who choose to walk through them and in that passage becoming more beautiful are able to do so. Maybe we will win or maybe we will fail spectacularly, but how wonderful, how liberating to discover that the more dire the situation becomes, the more powerful and creative our hearts can become. As if for all those years of sleeping, of not being much used, those hearts have not been atrophying, but waiting, resting, getting ready. i have been arrested before. The previous summer at the Montana State Capitol, protesting the state's willingness to sell at a thousand percent loss toxic coal to China. Coal too dirty to burn in our own country, surface mine from southeastern Montana's bucolic Otter Creek and Tongue River Valley. A business plan exists to get investors in China hooked on building coal plants, more coal plants, which will then raise the world's demand for coal, so that investors who own leases on the United States' vast coal reserves will have a market for their poison. The dirty coal from Montana is being subsidized, almost given away, to facilitate the development of this addiction. Sound familiar? A moral issue, then, though to be absolutely honest, what first caught my attention was the potential loss of a beautiful corner of my expanded backyard in Montana. I just can't seem to shake my old addiction to beauty. And in the Otter Creek protest, I was surprised by how easy it was and how good it felt. The police ask you to leave. You say something like, no thanks, not until the state land board denies the permit to give away the dirty coal in Otter Creek. <laughs> and next thing you know, you're wearing cuffs and going for a little ride, paying a little money, and it all feels good. It feels a hell of a lot better than just being quiet and letting the rough beast of Exxon or the Carlisle Group or Warren Buffett pass on by uncontested. Being arrested in D.C. was, as might be expected, a little more intense, and yet even more joyful. The support crews, people on your side who try to take care of you, make calls for you, etc., are always fantastic. Random images I have from the DC arrest are leaving the Sierra Club office in a caravan of black escalades, tinted windows, using a police escort with sirens wailing. Why? How? And Bill looking down at his feet and shaking his head and saying, this just doesn't feel right. <laughs> The junior senator from Rhode Island shouting at, exhorting 40,000 people to no longer stay asleep while the fossil fuels industry continues to dictate the world's economic and political policy. Don't be chumps. Don't be chumps. Daryl Hannah waving the peace sign as she giraffe walked to her arrest. What if I'd handcuffed myself to her instead of the White House gates? <laughs> Focus. The mercurial Bobby Kennedy pounding the pulpit in that so famous, so familiar, beautiful voice, still winding, and then riding out to the jail with him in the little paddy wagon. Five of us jammed in there like so many bird dogs in a too small wire mesh kennel. Listening to him regale the rest of us with the most wonderful, if often politically incorrect, jokes. <laughs> Me trying to hang with him, offering up one of my own. What did one snowman say to the other? Bobby, I don't know what. Rick, do you smell carrots? <laughs> Bobby, smiling, Bobby smiling weakly, then continuing on with his great ones, none of which, as they say, can be printed in a family newspaper. His son, Connor, riding in the wagon with us in his first arrest. My own 17-year-old daughter, Lowry, came out to join me for the big march on the White House that subsequent weekend. I've got great and lasting memories from the march as well. Bill, coatless at the podium in the 15 below windshield, and whether having forgotten a coat or knowing that he'd be much photographed and then ridiculed by the fossil fuel industry apologist for wearing a heavy, puffy coat, I don't know. Bill radiant and shivering both, saying how he'd waited 25 years to see this, saying with no irony, holy heck, as he looked out at the sea. 
I remember Lowry's exuberance at being swept up into a larger thing, the passion and hope of unity. The discovery, the witnessing of a family larger than our little one in the yak. We've handed her peers a shit sandwich, but maybe if we awaken, we can at least show them the deep passion of our reawakening. If she is any representative of her generation, it seems they are overjoyed to be given the encouragement to reach deep and dredge to the surface that which has been asleep in the rest of us for so long. That they will do so with or without our encouragement, but are glad to have us old folks along with them. I remember Reverend Lennox Yearwood saying, this is our Birmingham, this is our lunch counter moment. I remember the way we flowed, wove, braided, old and young and in between. I remember the exuberance and exhilaration, the wild and colorful costumes and the handmade posters. I recommend it, protesting and being arrested, highly. I'd like to see several million, even a hundred million, experience the joy and pride of ownership that is to be gotten by attacking directly the most powerful man-made force on Earth, the Earth-eating force of the major oil and gas companies. When I was a young man and playing football and lifting weights, I used to kind of brim with a certain fizz. I was a little on the small side. Certainly, compared to my brethren in the trenches, I was tiny. But I had a philosophy of going straight at the biggest guy in the fight, figuring that that was where the scrap was probably going to end up anyway, and better to get in there while fresh than exhausted. <laughs> We are all still fresh in this struggle, and it is, will be, is, the struggle of all of our lives and those who come after us. We need to wire, as if laying down electrical pathways, the models, the examples of how to fight. It's going to be a long one, and will determine the future and fate of our species and most others. I can't tell you how rewarding and empowering you'll find it. After a lifetime of failing or at best treading water, to be playing for truly everything, with everything to win and nothing to lose, for everything is already on the descent to loss. It feels good. At the march, when the speeches were over and the 40,000 plus of us were released into the streets, oozing and flowing like waves of light or like the largest one organism in the world, lifted up and carried along by one shared hope, the belief that we could stop the pipeline from coming through the heartland on its way to the Gulf of Mexico, where ships are waiting to take the heavy tar to Asia. It occurred to me that about one in a thousand of us, 46 among that crowd, were perhaps remembering the arrest of a few days previous, the two paths you can go by. We each had to be wondering, what if everyone agrees to be arrested until we bring the giant to its knees? The march was jubilant making, but I can't forget the arrest either, which was equally empowering. That form of civil disobedience being the furthest one can go against the terrible aggressor without actually participating in violence. Indeed, it occurs to me that being quiet and remaining asleep, even silent, is the greatest act of violence one can perform at this moment in history. On the march, 46 of us were carrying within us the palpitating memory of the cuffs, the loneliness and isolation, including that strange part where, upon being liberated, we walked one by one across the marshy meadowlands and the spitting snow and rain and fog to the pickup point a quarter mile distant. That had been great, but solitary, lonely. The march was the opposite. When it began, it was like nothing I've ever been a part of. It wasn't rabbit like a rock concert or sporting event, nor was it mind unification like yoga or some deeply felt religious experience. It was joyous and possessed to it the quality of being released as if from a long imprisonment. As if the prisoners had been in captivity for so long that they had forgotten how to imagine ever being free again. As if someone, however, had encouraged them to dream again to be courageous enough to resurrect and embrace hope, and had then gone a step further and opened the gate for them. At the protest, standing shoulder to shoulder on the grassy mall, we had not yet been able to see beyond ourselves. We knew there were a lot of us, 
We could sense it, all of us cloaked in parkas, and we could hear the sea roar of cheers and great masses of applause. But no single one of us below the speaker's stage could witness the expanse of us. For that, we had to watch the reflection of that sight in the awed gaze of the men and women up on the stage. It was only when we began to move, to flow through the barricades and into the streets with 40,000 different travelers from all over the country, singing and chanting in various clusters, connected but unconnected, random but coordinated by the jauntiness of hope and by the love of effort, that the fears that the speakers had been emoting about most fully filled us became ours. We wound through city blocks and passageways like one living thing. We traveled in mass through the city for hours. There was music and cheering. We wreathed and wrapped the city in our hope. It was a bummer that the president was playing golf that day in Florida with Tiger Woods. <laughs> Regrettable that he missed such a great civil rights action. But hopefully his aides were able to explain it to him. And hopefully when the arrests start, later in larger numbers this year, arrests by the thousands, the last and only nonviolent thing remaining that we can do at a time-tested successful American tradition as proved in previous civil rights struggles. Hopefully, he will get it then. We have it in our power to get his attention. Right now, he appears distracted. He appears almost to be in denial. We need force and imagination to get his attention back. No one person can do it. But together, all of us and everyone in a family can get his attention. Let this coming year be the year of arrest. Let it become a wholesome family activity like bingo or bowling. <laughs> the president understands family. Let us meet him where he is. We won't know the effectiveness of this march until many years into the future. But we will know immediately, in our first step of being arrested, the sweet joy of being on the right side of a thing, rather than in the damning and ultimately deeply regrettable unseeing middle, on a moral issue that is the largest of our time, the largest of our combined generations living today. It feels good to wake up. <laughs>